Amen. I have uh, been speaking on Sunday nights about questions I've been asked since I've been here. Uh, people have asked me, what does the Bible say about discouragement, depression? Uh, preacher, I've had it for a long time. I can't get over it. I have uh, spoken a message on depression. Worry is another subject that uh, an individual has asked me about, and I've spoken on m many others. Uh, just recently, some to come to, came up to me and said, Preacher, and they talked to me a while, and they said, I want to know if I've grieved the Holy Spirit. Have I committed sin that uh, made God cry? We talked a little bit, and I told the individual that if you'll come uh, a couple Sundays, one, well, I talked to her several weeks ago, or him, and uh, I said, if you'll come back this particular Sunday night, I'll speak on that subject. Uh, there is a deacons meeting tomorrow night at 6.30. Please uh, remember that very important deacons meeting tomorrow night at 6.30. The other, let me do a little housekeeping. Uh, since I've been here, I have called this church First Church. Uh, when I was at Fairview, I called it Fairview. The reason I do it, it's a whole lot shorter. <laughs> I, and I do mean Free Will Baptist Church. I will try to, it, when I do that, say Free Will Baptist, but you know I'm Free Will Baptist. Uh, I love First Church because it just reminds me of the best church. Uh, that ought to be a good point right there, okay? Amen. You know, and uh, so uh, I have no way or rhyme to not call it First Free Will Baptist Church of DeSoto. I just think that's a long name, and I just like to call it First Church. But if you want me to, I'll call it First Free Will Baptist Church of DeSoto, Missouri. 63020, uh, and uh, we'll go from there. No, just joking. There is a passage of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32. I read these verses Wednesday night deliberately and then went on with what I was talking about, discipleship. We were doing a series on discipleship on Wednesday night. There are eight uh, lessons on discipleship, very important. I did it deliberately. I didn't say anything about it, but I want to read it again. In your Bibles, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32, I hope you have a Bible, and if you don't, just turn to that Bible in whatever mechanism you use, whatever uh, uh, paraphrase or version you have. But let me give you this version because I think it's very plain. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. Each word is a gift. Each word is is a gift. Verse 30, don't grieve God. Don't break His heart. His Holy Spirit, moving and breathing in you, it's the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for Himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Verse 31, make a clean break with all cutting and backbiting and profane, profane talk. Verse 32, be gentle with one another, sensitive forgiving one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. What a powerful passage that is there. When you notice in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, in the New International Version and, and also in the King James Version, it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But he gives us a commandment. This is what he says, don't do. Then he says, this is what you, want, you need to do. God never gives us a statement of fact of what not to do or what to do without giving us behind it how to do it, or particular what I mean by that. So here's what he says. But that which is good to the use of edifying, building up. Everything I say should build someone up. If I'm tearing somebody, or we go on, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Otherwise, that it gives out unmerited favor. That when I speak, I give grace to people. When I speak, I build up people. That is so important. In fact, it's so important that Paul puts it in the Word of God and Jesus stamps his approval on it. In the translation, it means corrupt communication. And, uh, and really, uh, that idea in the Greek means rotten. Literally rotten speak. Per, uh, literally speak, speech that stinks, that smells, that's rotten, that's garbage. It's used for decaying flesh, rottening fish or rottening fruit. Have you ever uh, came home after some time away from your home? You got home and found out the electricity went out, and you go out to your freezer, and all that meat has spoiled. Have you ever opened that door? 
and that refresh, refreshing smell hits you. I remember our men went down to the southern part of South Carolina after hurricane hit, and uh, we were literally tearing houses down, and some houses were literally gutting them. We got in this one house, and we gutted it on the inside. Then we went, he said, oh, by the way, I've got a little porch out here that's got inside of it a freezer. So we got the door open. In order to get the, the freezer out, you had to shut the door, move the freezer, and then open the door. So I told the fellas, once we're inside, there's four of us, I said, listen to me, do not crack that lid, because if you do, we are going to be in trouble. So we started to push it. First thing, first thing, the fellow on the other side that was pushing it pushed for the lid, and it came wide open. We couldn't get out. There was no windows. There was no electricity, no fan. And there the four of us going there, and each one of us had the same language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, and uh, we're trying as fast as we can to get that slid down and, and open that door and shove that thing out. And it was heavy. But I want to tell you what, when you're trying to get out of something, you got to push something out. And it's that important and that stinking, you can push it out, I don't care how weak you are. And we got that thing out of there. That's what he's saying. That type of speech to one another, he's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. That type of speech in God's, in God's language smells like rotten fish and rotten meat to God. That puts emphasis on it. Otherwise, he says, don't let any putrid words come out of your mouth. Or we might say in the streets lingo, no trash talk. In fact, what qualifies as rotten speech? Well, I listed a few things. Vulgarity, obscenities. Indecent language, dirty jokes, off-color stories, pornographic language, racism, ethic insults, humor meant to be deliberately insult or put someone down, angry outbursts, harsh words, mean-spirited comments, gossip, rumors, false accusations, imputing bad motives, public criticism of your spouse or your children, yelling and screaming, threatening, intimidating comments, endless criticism, quick and cutting comments, cheap shots, talking too much, talking without listening, condemning others, exaggerating the faults of others, excusing unkind words that were deliberately meant to hurt someone by saying, I was only joking. No, you weren't. You're not man enough or woman enough to tell to their face the real fact in a gentle manner that you got to give a joke to tear them down, mean-spirited, to try to hurt them. So in this passage, I see, let, let me just give you four insights that Paul gives us. First of all, he gives us the charge in verse 29. And the charge is don't speak rotten. And look what he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But he also says, if you don't do that, but this is what I want you to do. Only speak words that are helpful. Words that edify, words that build up. Otherwise, our language as Christians to one another should never be rotten language. It never should be something that is destructive. It should never be something that tears someone down, destroys their character. It ought to be something that builds them up. Every one of us, every one of us needs someone to pat us on the back. We're tired of people kicking us in the rear. Everybody. And I'm telling you, whether you write it, whether you use Facebook or whatever tool you use, Look at what you're saying. If it's critical, if it's rotten, if it's, all it does is tear someone down or tear the church down or tear something down, you as a Christian should never do it. And stop giving me this junk that it's all right to do it because I'm trying to get a point across. God never gets a point across to His church in that language. Stop it. It's wrong. It's ungodly. It tears churches down. It splits churches. It hurts people. No one has given you the right to have the gift of irritation. No one. Every critical comment that comes out of your mouth, what the, you know what he's saying here? No, don't do it. Every filthy word that comes out of your mouth, don't do it. Every harsh word that comes out of your mouth, don't do it. Every cheap shot that comes out of your mouth, don't do it. Every bit of gossip that comes out of your mouth, don't do it. And why is that so important, Tim? Let me tell you why it's important. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life or death. The tongue can, ever help, can either help somebody or destroy somebody. Let me tell you, 
as Christians. We live in a rotten, stinking world that has beat us and beat us and beat us. And when we come to church or we get around God's people, there ought to be language that builds us up and edifies us and causes us to be drawn closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we open our mouth, either I'm spitting out life or I'm spitting out death. The Bible speaks of the throat as an open grave in Romans chapter 3, verse 13. When there is death on the inside, it will eventually show up on the outside. When there's rottenness on the heart or in the heart, it will come out through the mouth. According to Proverbs 12, 18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Let me tell you if you're wise or not. Your words bring healing. Wisdom is not in criticism. Wisdom is in compassion and comfort. Don't ever think that God has called you to destroy anybody. God never came to destroy us. He came to deliver us. Amen? James 3, 5 and 6 offers this penetrating warning. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also is a fire, word, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts, us, uh, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire, and in itself sets on fire by what? It's set on fire by hell. Either I'm having hell come out of my life, my mouth, or I'm having heaven come out of my life. There's no other way. There's no neutrality. Ephesians 4, 29 offers a Christian alternative. It says, first of all, we're to speak good words that build up instead of tear down. Secondly, he says, we are to speak words that minister grace to those who hear it. And we are to do it in all the time and in every circumstances. We can never have an excuse to do wrong. We never have an excuse to break God's word or God's commandment. If God says don't do it, why are we doing it? If God says don't do it, why do we make excuse? Well, preacher, you don't understand. I don't have to understand. Does God understand? Boy, it's quiet in here tonight. Here's the teaching of the verse, very simple. Every word, all good, all grace, all the time. Would you say it with me? Every word, all grace, all good, all the time. Remember that. Whenever you're going to speak, every word, all good, all grace, all the time. So when I speak, am I giving goodness? Am I giving grace every time I speak? Boy, it healed a lot of marriages. It healed a lot of, a lot of corruption. It healed a lot of problems, Amen. If everyone in our church would always come to church, or whenever we meet someone, you know what? What an opportunity to build this person up. What an opportunity to, to, to encourage them. Would you respect that subject tonight and the fact that God wants us to have good speech, godly speech, gracious speech all the time? Now, let me just go on quickly. Sometimes we need a friend to remind us to watch what we say. It was Gordon McDonald who tells a story, a trip that he took to Japan as a young man. One day he was talking to an elderly minister and he said something about one of his friends. And after he said it, it was sarcastic, sarcastic in remark. It was really unkind. It was unnecessary. Here's what that pastor said. A man who truly loves God would not talk about a friend like that. He said for 20 years of his life, every time he thought an evil thought, or began to talk evil about anybody, or accuse anybody, he remembered that a man of God, who truly loves God, would never talk about a friend that way. That would talk, take away a lot of talking. In fact, most of us, many times, if we did that, we'd look at a per person, and we'd walk up to him now, with that in mind, and we'd just sit there and stare at him. Because we're so used to criticize. So used to tear down. So used to... Mm, we always got someone on our mind to tear down. Someone who's hurt us. Someone who we don't like. We all have an excuse for what we say, don't we? We're tired. We're provoked. Or we weren't thinking. Or we didn't mean it. Or, well, anyway, it's true, preacher. And on and on we go to justify our verbal diarrhea. Right, you should have never said that. Please forgive me. Our verbal diarrhea. We all have people in our lives that drives us nuts. <laughs> Some people just seem, again, like they have the gift of literally irritation. Can be a wife, can be a husband, can be a friend, can be your children.
can be a mother-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law. Sometimes a person you work next to. Maybe someone sitting next to you in church. Don't look that way. Keep your eyes straight ahead. I don't want to say that. Go, see, I told you. <laughs> but notice not only the challenge. He, he says a charge in verse 30. He says, don't, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you're sealed into the day of redemption. Get rid of, and then he lists the things to get rid of, how not to, see, to really grieve the Holy Spirit. What is God saying here? What's he saying? He's saying no more stinking speech. Paul mentions the sad consequences of all unkind words in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Did you know that you can grieve the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you? The word grieve comes from the Greek word that signifies deep emotions. The Holy Spirit living inside of you has a deep emotion. And you can only grieve a close friend or a loved one. Think about this. You can't grieve an acquaintance. They're not close enough. You can't grieve a stranger. They're not close enough. You only grieve someone who's close to you. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. That's how you can grieve Him. The Holy Spirit hears everything you do. In fact, He's inside of you. Everything you, everywhere you go, he, you take Him with you. And you can grieve the Holy Spirit. As usual, Paul's advice is both practical and it is profound. We, we tend to talk about the interpersonal problems, and that's the great issue today. But let me tell you, verse 30 reminds us of our primary relationship is always with God. You hear me? Our primary relationship as a child of God is not with anybody else. Our primary relationship should be and is with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible to grieve the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit. You can make the Holy Spirit weep because of your thoughtless words. Here's the reason. The Holy Spirit not only lives in you, but He also lives in the Christian brother and sister you're talking to. So you're double grieving. You're grieving the Holy Spirit inside of you. You're grieving the Holy Spirit inside of them. Evil speech destroys Christian unity. It was D.L. Moody who wrote on the topic, and he commented that he had never known God, God to bless a church where the Lord's people were divided. Never. This is a word we need to hear. This is God's word. First Free Will Baptist Church of DeSoto, listen to me. This is for us. I want to make a statement, and listen carefully to the statement. We tolerate sometimes and even encourage a thoughtless attitude or thoughtless articulation from people because we will not take a biblical stance and correct it biblically. So we let it go in our church. We let it rot our church. We're too, afri we're too afraid to do what God says to do about it. So we go about doing it our will and we grieve the Holy Spirit. Because that individual who has those thoughtless words or this attitude or whatever you call it gets by with doing the very thing that God commands not to be done. But we are the keeper of the house of God. And we're the keeper of the Word of God. See, every time I speak carelessly, I hurt three people. I hurt the person I carelessly talk about. I hurt myself. And I hurt the Holy Spirit. Every time I open my mouth, one of two things happen. Every time I open my mouth, I either build someone up or I tear someone down. That does not mean that we never say anything. It doesn't mean that we should never say something difficult. The warning that goes to motivate or purpose must be judged by the context. Let me put this again. The warning goes to motive and the warning goes to purpose and must be judged by the context. Otherwise, Paul is saying, here's the situation. Why do I say what I'm saying? What is the motive behind it? Listen, you and I can never judge another person's motive. You don't have the wisdom to do it. Only God does. Sometimes people say, well, I know why they did it. No, you don't. You just lied. I can never tell, even the motive of my wife, I can't tell why she does it. I don't, I don't can't tell why she beats me up all the time. Hey, can I tell you what happened last night? Can I, honey? The circle. <laughs> so you know it's true. We were messing around, and she had a flashlight in her hand. And I was so kind and nice to her. And I was saying loving things to her. And all of a sudden, bam, right in my chest. Not only did her fist hit me, but the flashlight hit me. And I told her, I'm going to have bruise there in the morning. No, you won't. So I went to the dresser. I picked up an ink pen, and I circled where... 
<laughs> I circled where she hit me. Guess what this morning? I got a bruise there. Of course, I'm not telling about beating myself in the shower. I got one. No, I did. I really. I, no, I didn't do that. I got a bruise there. And I showed it to her. You know what her reaction was? Yeah. Get a life. I'm away. Yeah. See, I come with such burdens to preach to you. I come from a house that I get just poppy whipped all the time. <laughs> David, hush. <laughs> we grieve the Holy Spirit first by rotten speech, verse 29. But listen, we grieve it by rotten attitudes. Verse 31. These two things are not separate. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in the heart must eventually and will come out in words we say. Whatever is down in the well will come up and bucket sooner or later. Thirdly, the command, verse 31, get rid of. <laughs> he says, get rid of. Then he lists the things to get rid of. Now notice these words describe a collection of wrong attitudes that corrodes the inside of us. And every one of us, including Tim Hackett, has had these attitudes in your life and in my life. These produce spiritual jaundice that colors us. And people that see us see these attitudes and see the jaundice in us, and that's coming out of us. And none of us are immune from it. Listen, taken together, they form a kind of a spiritual staircase that literally ascends or the ascension of evil. First step is the step of bitterness, a word that means pointed or sharp, referring to the pain that we feel when we think we've been mistreated. Verse 31. It speaks as a deep emotional reaction that keeps us from thinking clear. Do you understand when you get bitter, you can no longer think honest and clear? And every one of us have been bitter. When you get bitter or you've been hurt and now you're bitter, number one, you cannot forgive. And many times, listen church, we will, down in the deep heart of ourselves, rather to carry bitterness and never give forgiveness. Because bitterness keeps us on top of the thing. Bitterness lets us say, they're the one that's guilty, not me. Bitterness, bitterness helps build us up and tear them down. It's interesting. Listen to, if we dwell in bitterness long enough, it produces a wounded spirit and a hard heart. Once you get to a certain level of bitterness, don't have time to go there, but once you get to a certain level of bitterness, your heart and conscience becomes seared. And you can no longer think straight. And no one can touch your heart. And no one can get inside of you. You built a wall. Second step is wrath. It's a word that originally meant to snort. Oh, what a word. Remember that last night, fellows, you're at the game thing, the guy, yeah. Snort. It has the idea of nostrils being flared in anger. When you get, I mean, honestly, when people really get anger, if you'll notice their nostrils, they will whoop. They get big. They're snorting. This is hot tempered anger that, that explodes into, under the slightest provocation. When we get bitter, it doesn't take much to set us off. Because all that's inside of us is a ra raging wrath of anger and bitterness. And it will come out. We can use the same image when we speak about someone being all steamed up. Smoke coming out their ears. You ever heard that expression? They're so mad I saw smoke coming out their ears. The third step, anger is the word anger itself. In verse 3, this word speaks of settled condition of the heart. In fact, did you know a person who is anger, I know a person who is angry all the time. I mean they get up angry, they go to bed angry, they eat angry, they go to work angry, they come home angry, they play angry, and everything they do is angry. And if they ever get happy, they're angry about getting happy. They're just angry. They are angry all the time. And I'm telling you, they're hard to deal with. Anger leads to jealousy and harsh words, and it even leads to murder. There are a lot of people, a lot of people, who commit murder in the midst of their anger that they would not get control of, that they'd never murdered if they dealt with anger. Angry people usually express themselves in brawling and express themselves in clamor, verse four, or the first four step. It includes all physical forms and verbal intimidation. In fact, it's the idea of shouting back. It's a form of quarreling. And you know why we yell when we're angry? The loudest one we think wins. And so we think 
that we're given better defense by getting louder. No, you're getting less defense. It's like the preacher one time, his young preacher, he's preaching, and his message was terrible. And he thought, well, you know what, I'm going to get this. And so when he was preparing the message, he had a very weak point, and he put there, shout loud at this point, very weak. <laughs> so he got to that point, very weak, and when he shouted, it made it weaker. How many arguments could be avoided if we didn't raise our voice? You know what Proverbs says, 15.1? A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Sometimes we know what ticks a person off, and we know what doesn't. I always say, don't do what ticks them off, and do what doesn't tick them. Don't do it, but just do right. If you know this person has a problem with such and such, or a problem with this particular person, don't talk about that person in front of them. Why do you have to talk about that person? Don't bring up the subject. Shut your mouth. Keep your mouth shut. Because if you know there's some type of hurt or anger or bitterness there, keep it quiet. Let God deal with it. Listen, I'd rather you deal with me than God deal with me. The next step is slander. Paul used a very strong word in this form of evil speech. It, it means to make false accusations about someone, or it means to offer vague insinuations about another person, looking, making them look worse than they really are. We can slander with our words. You ever certain, seen a person just raise their eyebrows? You know they're angry, they're bitter, they're just, mm, they get mean looking. It means, uh, uh, it can come with unfinished sentences. Many times a person is angry, and they'll say, I'll tell you what, mm, just quit talking. Sometimes it means rhetorical questions that leave you dangling in the air. Uh, or you can do it by a, uh, quoting someone else. You know, we can slander through insults. We can slander through ridic ridicule and crude jokes and taunts and unkind nicknames and rumors and mocking and belittling uh, by passing unfair and hasty judgment. Really, the legal term for this word, for the word that means really slander, is de defamation of character. Now, who gives a Christian character? I'll take a drink on that. Who gives a Christian character? So when you're slandering his child, you're slandering the creator of his character. You can't do something to a child of God without doing it to God. Have you ever had someone hurt your child? You know, that's tough because parents love their children. If you hurt their children, you hurt them. Amen? Amen? Oh, really? Now listen, there, I, as a pastor, I've been pastor long enough. Pam and I knows it. Knows it. Pam and I knows this. Pam and I know this. Do not, do not upset anybody's children. Is a preacher, how can you pastor that way? You just keep your mouth shut. You know, I, I look at it this way. My dad always taught me to pick my battles. There's a lot of battles out there, but I'm not going to fight some of them. I've had people come to me and say, Preacher, you need to take care of this. I said, you brought it up, you take care of it. I'm not going to do your dirty laundry. And here's what happens. If I took care of it, I'd be out there. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me, Glenn. You shouldn't have done this. And then, well, who said I did that? Well, I told him. So we go meet that person, and here's what they'll say. I don't remember saying that. And now I'm out there dangling. I just hung myself. And you know what? I don't do that. What I do, I have a piece of paper. It's on my desk, and if you have a complaint, you write it down and sign it, and I'll take it to the person. I've never had one person sign that paper. Words give us control over others. We all feel better if we can name something. In fact, every word we say impacts our relationship for good or for ill. Once a slanderous word escapes our lips, listen to me carefully, it changes our relationship forever. Forever. In fact, you know Jesus, they mocked him. All kinds of slanderous words about him, false accusations about him. And the result of that slander was the Son of God was crucified. It killed him. There's a lot of people in the grave and no one shot a shot but they put him there with words. Malice. 
describes an underlying attitude of ill will. It's a general dislike. Malice can be described as congealed hatred. It's a malicious person who can't get along with anybody. You ever met somebody like that? They don't get along with anybody. In fact, if they looked in the mirror, they have an argument. They're, they just can't get along. Well, notice the progression of slander, clamor, anger, wrath, bitterness. What starts in the heart ends up in the lips. And what begins in bitterness ends up as slander. We think, we feel, and then we speak. What starts as a grievance becomes an outburst of wrath that hardens by anger over time and express, expressed in clamor and slander. Malice marks such a person through and through. We're doing Satan's work when we climb the stairway. And every step is for Satan. Notice Paul says to get rid of all bitterness, no root of bitterness, no symptom of bitterness, no trace of anger, no echo of clamor, no slime of, of slander, no dredge of malice. And then he said, notice the choice. He said, don't do this. Get rid of this. But notice what he says, verse 32. Here's the choice. Put on. And he talks about kindness and compassion and forgiveness one to another. Now let me just park here just a moment. Paul gives them a better way. Paul gives them a better choice. Stop doing negative things and start doing positive things. In fact, stop doing things that pull people down and start doing things that lift people up. Every person you know in this church, every person you know in the body of Christ, when you walk up to them, when you walk up to them, automatically say, I'm going to say something that will build them up. It would change our whole relationship. Well, preacher, you don't understand. I don't have to understand. I'm not being ugly, but I know what God says. And what is true for you is true to me. And I have had many times to bite my tongue. One time I bit it so hard, seriously, I began to bleed. Oh, I wanted to say something. Oh, man, did I want to say something. Man, I had it all down in my mind. I had step one, step two, step three, step four. I even had A, B, and C's under each one of them. And then I had little ones, two, and three under the ABCs. And God wouldn't me say, let me say any of it. But God, I had it all prepared. And I bit my tongue. And I am so glad today I bit my tongue. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ did for you. So number one, he said kindness. Be kind. Kindness speaks of a gentleness and face in, in the midst of any provocation. It reaches out to the unworthy and withholds punishment even to those who deserve it. Kindness really is daring and danger because it it's many times is mistaken as weakness. The oil that lubricates the machinery of life is kindness. It's kindness. You can go a long ways on kindness. Just kindness. Wow. Tenderheartedness. Compassion comes from a word called good, that word means good intestines. Wow, where did they get good intestines? Out of tenderheartedness. In the Old Testament times, the intestines was the seat of the emotion. They thought that your emotions were controlled by your intestines. Now think about it. Have you ever been upset and have an upset stomach? Have you ever had diarrhea in the mouth and guess what else? You know what? That's where they thought. They thought the intestines was the seat of the emotions. But really it's the heart that's the seat of the emotions. We mean something that means, really the word here, uh, the, our emotions, you ever heard, oh, we always get the word from what they used to describe, intestinal emotions. You ever heard of belly laugh? You laugh so hard your belly was shaking. You know, you, it's called belly laugh. Compassion says, I will care for you. I will not shut you out. Forgiveness of one another. The key to forgiveness is the middle syllable. Give. For give -ness. It's a gift. It's the same gift that God gave you. Listen to me. Forgiveness is a gift we give those who don't deserve it. In fact, note verse 32 starts with us and ends with God. <coughs> we're kind. We're compassionate. We're to be forgiving to others because that's how God treated us. It's from God to us and to others. We do for others what God has done for us. Let me ask you a question. Well, let me put it this way. You cannot, you cannot understand God's love unless you go to the cross. And you cannot understand the cross until you know God's love. Listen. His death was a sacrifice that brought a sweet aroma to God. And through that sweet aroma, God accepted the sacrifice. And that sweet aroma allowed God to see us who turned to His Son and asked their forgiveness to be the sweet-smelling aroma of the kingdom of God. 
Now listen to me. When we don't do this, we smell and act and are rotten. We lose the aroma of God. Man murders because man's murder becomes God's literally sacrifice. This hideous, this horrible crime is an impossible debt that God paid for you and I. I love the song. See from his hands, his feet, and his head. Sorrow and love flows mingled down. Did e'er such love or sorrow meet? Or thorns compose such rich a crown? That's what God did for us. In fact, the text ties the most practical spiritual duties within the loftiest spiritual truths. Otherwise, it says here, don't, don't trash talk. No more bitterness, no more wrath, no more anger, no more clamor, no more slander, no more malice, no more making the Spirit of God weep. God asks us to do what He already has done. We're not to forgive in order to be forgiven. We forgive because we've been forgiven. And our faith should imitate God Himself. Now, you say, well, preacher, you don't know what they did to me. I do know what we did to God. They did not spill your blood. You have not resisted the blood. There's no reason, there is, there is, it is a sin not to forgive. Because forgiveness is a commandment. Folks say, well, preacher, you don't know how hard it is. You know what they did. You know what? When you forgive, you turn loose of your bounds and your change, and you turn loose of all of your resentment towards that person, and you throw it in their court, and for the first time God can deal with them. But as long as you hang on to it, you become between them and God. And before you pray to God, you've got to pray through them. You've got to pray through them. But when you give it to God, God slips it aside, and He walks and talks with you intimately. You forgive. I forgive because I've been forgiven. I can tell you about some folks who did some horrible things to Pam and I. I can tell you about a church that fired Pam and I on Christmas. We had to have guards at our house because they took a shotgun to us. And they promised they were going to kill me. And we had to move at night. We had no money. They didn't even pay me my salary. And I had to borrow some money from a friend of mine. And we literally stored our, our furniture in Nashville, Tennessee in the basement of Sam McVeigh's house. No, it was Sam McVeigh, yeah, it was Sam McVeigh's house. And for three months, we had no place to go, no place to live, and no money, no income. I tried to get a job. Everywhere I went was no. We did some traveling. We were trying out at different churches. And I came to a point where I said, I've had it. The only thing I know about church people is that they're mean. And they'll act like you love, they love you, but they'll talk behind your back. They'll ask you to do anything for them, but they won't do anything for you. And so I came to a point, and Pam will tell you it's true, that I told God I'm through. I'll never pastor again. I told you part of the story one time, but I went to J.C. Penney's where I used to work, and the manager was going to give me a job as a manager. Great salary, great income, great future. And I went back, I think, the next day or so, and Mr. Lacey, who was a godly man, he was a deacon in a Baptist church, and he said, I am not giving you this job. I said, why? He said, Tim, God didn't call you to be a manager. God called you to be a minister. You're not coming to work for me. I said, Mr. Lacey, I don't have any money. He said, how much you need? <laughs> that blew that excuse, didn't it? So we went to a church up in Virginia. They're having a revival. Second night of revival, the pastor got up. He said, there's a young couple here. With a family. The church did them so dirty. They have no money, they have no income, nowhere to live and nowhere to go. It's our church's responsibility. <laughs> and they took up an offering. It was unbelievable. They gave it to us. And within two weeks, we started pastoring 
First Bible for a Baptist church in, in Newcastle, Indiana. But in those weeks, I had to forgive the head deacon of that church and the deacons and the church and everyone in the church. And to this day, if they called me, I would help them. I have no animosity. It was one of the greatest lessons I learned in life about forgiveness. You don't forgive someone because they deserve it. You forgive someone because God deserves it. It's hard. But I found out it's the greatest thing you'll ever do. And I had such peace and such relief. Fact of the matter, I knew this when I was going through it. I could never preach another sermon until I forgave. I would be lying. I would be lying. You say, preacher, <laughs> let me ask you this quick. What if God treats you the way you treat that person who you won't forgive? You wouldn't be saved. And if you have children, you can't pray for them. If you have a problem, you can't pray for it. Because if God will not forgive you because you won't forgive, your prayers will not be answered. It's a terrible place to be in. What if God were as unkind to you and unmerciful to you as you are to another person? What if God kept a record of your sin? What if God just wrote down that date you did such and such like you may have in your heart or mind wrote down that date when that person did this to you? What if God wrote it down? And every time you came to Him, He'd say, wait a minute, Tim. Read that right there. Read that right there. You want me to forgive you, but you won't forgive the other? Uh-uh, don't work that way. <laughs> what if God said to you, you know what? I'm going to trash Tim Hackett. Same way he trashed me. I'm going to hurt him the same way he hurt me. I'm going to destroy him like you hurt me. Like, like they did him and he won't forgive. I'd never get a million miles from heaven. Do you want to know what troubles me the most about this text? I see myself. I see myself. It's hard to preach a message when he talks to you. I don't know where you are tonight. It's not my business. But I do know. I do know. And I promise you I know this. When I let go, God came in. And when I let go, God cut the strings and God tore down the wall. And there was a peace that hit me that I never had before. If I could only say one thing to you, I love you dearly. You know I do. But I love you so much. I don't want you to be miserable. And I don't want you to miss God's blessings. And uh, let me put it this way. There's not a person on this earth worth destroying your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nor your prayer life, nor anything else. Not a person. Listen. Go ahead. Whip me if I'm the person. Do not forgive me and let God whip me. You know what I said? Go ahead, whip me. Don't forgive me and let God whip me. <laughs> Just keep on whipping me. I'll be all right with that. I mean that. I mean that. Because you whip me, it's temporary. God whips me, it's eternal. <laughs> Listen, God can do what none of us can do. You know, God, I don't, I don't think you know this, but you know God can keep you awake at night? You know, God can take a pillow and make it a rock. You know, God, <laughs> there have been nights when I, have, I know it was me, and, and I just wouldn't say, God, forgive me. There was nights. I'd cover up. I, was, I was, got hot. I'd uncover. I got cold. I, I couldn't sleep, so I sat up. I got sleepy. I went back to bed. I was awake. I'd do this. I'd, the opposite. I was thirsty. Went and got wetter. Up uh, wetter. I got wetter. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> I went and got water. 
still thirsty. Got up, sat in the living room. I watched TV when a stinking program on that I liked. I like westerns. They're all dead. Everybody was shot. I tried everything. And finally, aren't we like this? I said, all right, God, what is it? You? It's almost like he said, Tim, you know what it is. And I had to kneel, and I had to pray. I had to ask God to forgive me. Sometimes I've had to go ask the person. Let me get a little secret, little secret, little secret. If the person doesn't know about it, don't approach them. Just give them forgiveness. Do not approach them. It's the worst thing and most unbiblical thing you can do. And it will cause something that you don't want caused. Can I tell you? I got, I got just three minutes. Woo! Let me tell you this illustration. Man came to me. And you're not going to believe this. I mean, you're not, you're, you may think I'm wrong. Man came to me. He was a Christian. He had an affair on his wife years and years ago. And there, he'd asked forgiveness of God. Everything was clear. Everything was going fight, uh, fine. He came to the office. He said, you know what, preacher? I think I need to tell her. I said, No. And he said, I think I need to tell my wife all the things I did before I got married. I said, no, you will be divorced within a month. He went and told her, they're not together anymore. That is stupid. If God has forgiven you, why are you digging in God's graveyard to get something to bring up and tell someone? God has forgiven you, throwing it as far as the east from the west. Now, if it's something that has to do with illegal, something that has really hurt someone, like physically, like rape, something like that, that's a different story. But there's other stuff, listen to me. Leave it in God's hands. You'll be a whole lot better. He came back to tell me, preacher, I wished I'd have listened. The saddest day of my life is the night I told her. She had built me on a pedestal. And she had promised God she'd only marry a righteous man. She couldn't handle it. And my marriage and my children, I lost it all. Don't do it. Some of the best things we can do is just forgive somebody and then sit behind them and sing, Oh, I love Jesus. And you don't know it, but I forgave you. I love Jesus. I forgave you too. <laughs> I'm happy you're not. I'm happy. Sometimes I'm crazy. But it's good. Sometimes I love it as a pastor to walk up with someone who dearly hurt me. I know they did. They never asked for pity. I've forgiven them. And I just walk up and talk to them like nothing's ever wrong. Pam knows that. Pam does it too. And sometimes I, the old devil gets in me. I get up there and say, just say, yeah, 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 yeah. Then God gets in me. Are you dumb? Have God ever. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm different. No, God never said that. But I mean this passage tonight. The best thing I could do for you, the best help I could give you is the remedy that God gave me. Don't grieve me. Don't let me weep. All you got to do is I gave you three things. Just do it. I know you're saved. I'm not talking about unsaved. Just do those things. And you'll never regret it. And the Holy Spirit will leave the grief and it'll come with joy. You can't have joy and grieve the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Think about it. Think about it. Whatever you need to do, do whatever it takes to get God's peace in your heart. And don't let anybody come between you and God. Again, I tell you, whoever can change your emotion controls you. Don't let anybody control you but the Holy Spirit. Father, go with us now, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.